Nashville, good morning. My name is Andrea Fanta, and I am the press secretary to Mayor John Cooper. Yesterday at the 58th State of Metro Address, Nashville heard Mayor Cooper's vision for making Nashville a city that works for everyone in every neighborhood. Today, we hear a more detailed presentation about the budget strategy to achieve that goal. You'll hear first from Kevin Crumbo, Metro's finance director, and then two members of the mayor's office of performance management. We won't be able to take questions live today, but if you are a reporter and you have a question, please email me at andrea.fanta at national.gov. We always love to hear from you. At this time, please join me in welcoming Metro's finance director, Kevin Crumbo. Thank you, uh, Andrea, for the uh, introduction, and uh, good morning to our uh, audience that uh, may be viewing in. Yesterday, Mayor Cooper introduced his budget proposal for fiscal year 22. The purpose of our presentation today is introducing a few more details and providing a foundation for the next part of the budget process, the Metro Council review and its deliberations. If meeting space and time had allowed yesterday, I would have followed the mayor's remarks with the details that cover uh, what I will in the next few minutes. I would have started by thanking the mayor for bringing forward a budget that moves our city to a sustainable financial position. I would also have thanked Vice Mayor Shulman, Council Budget and Finance Chair Toombs, for their support over the last year and preparing for the upcoming deliberations. And of course, I would thank our budget team, part of the finance office, for their tremendous work in managing the budget process. The team is led by Tom Edelman, a longtime Metro finance leader whose steady hands this budget would not be possible. And I'm thankful every day for the challenges he's helped us navigate. That team has been matched by counterparts in the mayor's office who will be also providing more details about the budget priorities here today. Together, they're the ones who have conducted the meetings with department heads, elected officials, Metro schools, other components of the Metro government, and other meetings throughout the community to arrive at this budget. They've worked a lot of days and a lot of nights, and I'm thankful for all of their efforts. Their dedication to a budget process that is efficient, that is transparent, and above all, promotes a sustainable future to our city is much needed, much welcomed, and they did a great job with it. At this point, I would have reminded the mayor that when he asked me to take this role, that it was primarily to stabilize Metro's financial position. At that time, neither of us could have known the road to stability would take us through devastating natural disasters, the COVID-19 pandemic, social unrest, and a bombing of Nashville's historic downtown area. Stability remained the mission. That mission is accomplished. Sustainability is now within our reach. I'll now turn to a presentation that is being posted uh, to our website. It's a lengthy presentation and one that I understand is quite traditional uh, long before my arrival at the Metro government. That is being posted on our website. Again, uh, because of its length, I, I'm going to touch on a few of the major slides there that will illustrate where we are from a stability standpoint and how sustainable our future can be with this budget. So what is our financial position now? It's a stable financial position. I'm not the only one who thinks so. Our report card, day in, day out, uh, is by rating agencies, uh, financial rating agencies for our bonds and other metrics about the metro government. They've rated us stable, double A in most instances. That is because our core financial trends are now favorable. Our revenues are up. Our spending matches the size of the city and our growth opportunities. Our debt has been refinanced to lower rates. Our cash and fund balances now approach levels that are recommended by the government office of uh, uh, financial officers around the country. That's usually about two months or so of operations. And very importantly, and concurrent with this budget process, our Metro Employee Benefits Board is deliberating changes to uh, what's known as our OPEB liability, which may reduce that nearly $4.2 billion liability by $1 billion. And I'll be talking more about that before I leave the podium uh, still today. Those core trends are bolstered by the American Rescue Plan. That plan will bring more than half a billion dollars to the general government, to our public schools, and to other agencies throughout the community. It is that plan that, by and large, would move us from the stable position that we enjoy today on our own to one that is sustainable for generations to come. 
I mentioned financial rating agencies. So what do they have to say about us? Well, again, they have confirmed a AA investment grade rating with a stable outlook. And Standard & Poor's, well known, I know to many, uh, view our credit strengths as the status of the state capital that we have here in the economy that goes around that, the strong management that we have now at the Metro government. But they do point out our challenges, our debt load that I'll talk about in a moment, pensions and OPEB liability that, again, I'll cover in another slide or two. We can go to the next slide. Moody's uh, also confirming the same thing as Standard & Poor's. Uh, they have pointed to our thinning cash reserves, which are much improved even in the last few months. Uh, they also point to uh, the debt burden. So we are a stable government. We can be a sustainable one. The American Rescue Plan, some of the plans that are in this budget should move us to that sustainable level. So first, let's look back at how we've become stable. The core tenet of that has been a growth in revenue. And there's been a lot of uh, questions and, frankly, a lot of criticism about our revenue performance and how our forecasts may be tracking to actual activity. I went back and looked since 2010 to see what my predecessors, prior governments, have done, how close have they been to their revenue forecast. And as you can see there, it's very close. Single-digit percentages the whole way, and that will not be any differently uh, computed this year. We're only part of the way through the year, so there is more to come. If that amount turns out to be more than 5%, I think it would be a delight to everyone. But I'm thrilled that we're coming close to our budget that's helped us manage and operate well throughout the year. Next slide. Forecasting those revenues have been a challenge. We've been in an unprecedented economic environment that has challenged traditional forecasting. Those challenges were magnified by the natural disasters, the social unrest, the downtown bombing, and so many other challenges that are known to all. The biggest part of our 5% or so that I've mentioned earlier really comes down to our activities taxes. Primarily, as you can see on the slide, our local option sales tax, the state sales tax, business tax. How those go in the future will be primarily determined by the growth of the uh, macro economy nationwide and more locally, our own vaccination timeline, its effectiveness, how critical the federal stimulus programs become to our operations. Lots of other factors that I've listed on the next slide that go into our thinking. Looking down the list of details there, None more important on that list, in my view, than the federal stimulus monies and their impact in our fiscal year that is just uh, coming to a close and the one ahead. The CARES Act funding, very important to us uh, nationwide. Not just the CARES money, the 120, uh, 21 million that came to the Metro government, but what went into the pockets of our businesses to our consumers that really bolstered our activities taxes. Those were big numbers. They had a nice economic impact. They worked. We should hope for the same thing from the American Rescue Plan. Next slide. So where will that leave us in the year ahead? For fiscal year 22, we're forecasting right now all in uh, $2.6 billion in revenues, which is a single-digit percentage increase over this last year, totaling some $180 million. So the revenue outlook. The composition of our revenue outlook has changed since last year. The increase in the property tax has stabilized our revenue base. And as you'll see in a slide I have here in the moment, it's become the majority of the revenues for the Metro government. Property taxes are the most stable form of revenue that most local governments can have. Ours is now quite stable and leads us to the stable financial position that I mentioned a moment ago. In terms of forecasting where we go from here, our activities taxes will be largely a function of the things that I mentioned a moment ago. There isn't a perfect crystal ball. We just have to use the information that's available to us. We're expecting to grow in the year ahead. We've tried to predict that in such a way uh, that is conservative and leads us to a good outcome. We'd be delighted if it comes in ahead of our forecast. So in terms of the revenue growth and what that's looked like in prior years, we have here a stair step that starts in 2018, leads us to fiscal year 22, and really speaks for itself. National has continued to grow its revenue base, and it will need to do that in the future in order to move itself to the sustainable uh, financial future that I think we can all hope for. So where does that money come from? 
This is the chart I'd mentioned a moment ago. As you can see, a majority of our revenue now flows from property taxes. Stable, reliable, that's what our city needs. For the other components we have here, the activities taxes, the local option sales taxes, the grants and so forth, those are also vital to us, but they can be more volatile than property taxes. So underlying our property taxes, obviously a lot of interest in a reappraisal year, which we're in now, and what our certified tax rate will be. The certified tax rate goes through quite an intricate process. It starts with a, uh, an assessment and a reappraisal year. Uh, that is done by our very talented uh, uh, assessment officials, Vivian uh, Wilhout and her team. And they have brought to us what the value of the county is. She's given a separate presentation about that that I don't think I need to repeat here. But it is then our goal uh, as an administration to work with the state and arrive at an equalized rate which essentially means that uh, our revenues, except for uh, new construction and so forth, really need to be the same as they were the year before so that as we rebalance the rate, that it's fair to all the taxpayers. And so if we could go back to that slide just for a moment. And so the way we express that rate and the way that it appears um, in all of our documents is expressed to three digital, I'm sorry, three decimal place, places. The most commonly quoted rate is the combined GSD, USD rate for the Metro government, which is 3.288, as you can see here on the slide. So that will be the rate we are proposing. That now goes through a uh, process with the state where they will affirm that rate, and then it will come to the, uh, to the mayor, uh, to the Metro Council for a final approval before it's finalized into the budget. So where does that rate stand relative to other uh, major cities in the state? This uh, graph illustrates uh, the similar rates in Chattanooga, Knoxville, and Memphis and Shelby counties. Uh, the rate is significantly lower, uh, but I think we do need to recognize that first, uh, those counties uh, and cities have not uh, made it known, at least to us, that uh, their rates will not change as well in the coming year. So this is based on the best information that we have from their prior year. And then also every county government is a little different. Ours, of course, include schools. Others may not, and they may include or exclude things that we do. But this does give a sense that our rate overall still is dramatically lower than the other uh, major cities in the state. The $180 million that I mentioned earlier, again, property taxes, local taxes. We also have what are called pilot programs or payments in lieu of taxes. One of our major ones is coming to a close here. And so declines in our revenue that we needed to uh, see from other sources have come down to um, our, what's called our uh, convention center MOU. Uh, we've also seen the hall tax uh, start to uh, dissipate uh, as planned. And then there's some other items of a similar fate that uh, total close to 15 million. So that's the bridge from what our revenue growth has been uh, previously to what it is uh, today. And in relative to prior years, as you can see, starting in 2018, 2019 and forward, um, our growth here has uh, been pretty consistently up. And if we go to the next slide, we can see where those property tax trends are as well. So as I mentioned earlier, property taxes bring us stability, and you can see from the chart here that those are continuing to grow and add numerically uh, to, our, to our stability. Sales taxes. Sales taxes are more volatile, and we can see that in this chart. Uh, looking back at fiscal year 20, fiscal year 21, we can see where is our uh, pandemic, uh, other factors started to influence our activities uh, where there was a change in 2020, uh, reversing change in 2021, and we're hopeful in fiscal year 22 that we'll continue to see the rise. Right now we're forecasting $455 million in total. So where are those revenues? The cost changes that correspond to those, the things that invest in our city over the course of the last year leave us. The best measure of that is where we end with our fund balances and our cash balances. And those terms are often used quite interchangeably. The difference between them is that fund balances rely on an accrual basis of accounting, which does its best to match revenues and expenses in the same time period that they occur. Cash is cash, as the saying goes, and it's much like a checkbook where some days it's high, some days it's low. In this particular year, our cash and fund balances have come very close together, both exceeding $300 million. 
we think that that's where we will end this fiscal year. There's still a little time to go, so the number could change. And we have budgeted in such a way that we can maintain those fund balances and those cash balances for the year ahead. We're going to need those. There's going to be demands on those cash, and it's going to be very important that we maintain uh, the levels that we've achieved now. My view is that that is one of the primary drivers that will move us from stability to a sustainable future. More numerically with the fund balances, we've broken those down by the uh, major funds that they pertain to. For those that are long time adverse, I'm sorry, uh, observers of the Metro government, you'll recognize the operations, the debt, the schools, and so forth. Those numbers agreeing to the slide that we had before. And if we'll move to the next slide, we can see where we have the same thing laid out for cash balances. If we can go to the next slide, please. And again, those by the, uh, by the same funds. I've emphasized at the bottom of two of the slides that this is fund balance neutral. It's cash balance neutral. That is so that we don't invade the good progress that we made. So how will that money be spent? Where does it go? Well, the mayor's office is going to talk more in a moment about the mayor's priorities, the investments in the community. But to sum it all up into one pie chart, you can see that education is the preponderance of the uh, dollars that we spend here as a metro government. Debt service, public safety, other components that are well known uh, for our local government make up the rest of the pie. The debt service, as I'm going to move to here in a moment, uh, is starting to level off, which is a very good thing here for all of the obvious reasons. It's been said that Nashville has a high debt load, and I think by some measures that may be true. It's turning out, though, that that debt level is very manageable. It is that debt that has led to the building of our city over a long period of time. It is those investments that will help us prosper in the future. So I am not uh, as concerned as many about our debt level. Um, it has reached a point to where it needs to be watched very closely and only adding to it at times where it makes good sense uh, to be good investors in our community. So here's a graph that gives a bit of the history of what the debt service is. It's a big component of our, uh, of our operating budget. As I mentioned earlier, you can start to see on the tail end of the graph, it's leveling off at 13, 14% of our total budget. Again, a watchful eye in the future. The principal balance that underlies that, uh, again, uh, starting to tail off there on the uh, far right of the graph. Very good sign of things to come for Nashville. Operating funds and expenses. This is one of the most interesting graphs when I think about all of Nashville and I look at what our expenses are as a city, including debt service and how that matches up to the public that we serve. And so all in one place, you can see going back to fiscal year 12, we have other fiscal years that are a little hard to fit on the graph, how those expenses rise with our population to really meet the needs of the community. We're not expecting fiscal year 22 to be any different than that, but to recognize that in the last few years, we've held back our spending. There's a lot of pinned up demand, as the saying goes, to invest more in our community. And the mayor's office will be talking more about that here in just a moment. Education, as I mentioned, the largest component of our metro budget, uh, now coming close to $1.1 billion for the year ahead. As we can see there, the operations component is a large number, the debt service too is a large number, but similar to the metro government, starting to level off, starting to see those investments in our schools previously pay off, and I'm quite confident the ones in the future will do the same. There's been a lot of discussion about the burden of funding our schools on the local government versus the state government and what the enrollment looks like that leads up to a great many of the calculations and determines the dollars that the local and the state government are going to put towards education. We tried to bring that together in one graph here. And what's represented there in the orange is the local funding. What's represented there in the blue is called the basic education plan or the state funding. And as you can see there, since the pandemic began and other challenges to our school, we've seen a bit of a dip in the enrollment and the way that's computed, and then it's starting to rise again. I think it is one of the leading indicators that the mayor is correct in how he's bringing forward the budget to invest in this education, to recognize that, that enrollment is already starting to come up from the pandemic levels, very likely to continue to rise as our economy develops and our community grows. The American Rescue Plan. 
I'm going to uh, really wrap up in talking about the American Rescue Plan for this reason. The slides that I've highlighted, the others that are posted on our website, the information that's there about our debt, there's a tremendous amount on that website. They paint the picture of a city that has solved a great many of its own problems. It has become stable, that mission that the mayor asked me when I first came on board. To move to sustainable would require a lot more money. And I don't think that that money can come quickly from our natural revenue sources. But we have the good fortune that the federal government has uh, brought forward a plan, the American Rescue Plan, that in our case will bring more than half a billion dollars to our city. Except for a very small portion of that money that's available for some immediate uses and some much needed uses, roughly six, six and a half million dollars, the remainder of those monies uh, will be addressed after this budget process. And I've come to view this internally from my own calculations of monies that are inside of our budget, our core budget, and those that are outside. I think that we learned a great deal from the CARES process and the way that money arrived. It arrived about a year ago and it took a long time for the guidelines to become clear from the federal government as to how the money could be applied and then of course for ourselves coming together as communities as to how we would like to apply it. The path of the American Rescue Plan seems to be going a similar way. I've put here on the slide the eligible uses that uh, seem to be uh, formulating right now, those that we expect to stick, but we're waiting for further guidance. A half a billion dollars is a great thing. It's spread over uh, a few years period of time in terms of, of how we uh, receive it. As I have there on the first bullet, uh, to go back to that slide for a moment, uh, first payment is expected in May uh, this year and then another one in the springtime of next year. That is 267 million schools is expected to receive more than 300 million, all of which is great news, but it will create a challenge for our cash and fund balances, primarily for this reason. The treasury functions are such that the metro government needs to finance the schools. It is the state that is expected to manage that 300 million or so through a grant process and the timing that it takes to spend the money to qualify them for the grants to get that reimbursement. We're hoping to be a very short time frame, but for lots of reasons, it could turn out to be a longer one, and that will stretch our cash and put us in a position here to where we need to be just as sensitive to our cash flow in this coming year as we have in the prior, but for reasons of growth as opposed to a pandemic or some of the other things that have brought us to that uh, conclusion in the past. So again, there's a preliminary framework that is coming together. I think Kristen Wilson and her team in the mayor's office are starting to bring that together. Uh, they're working with uh, Deputy Director Mary Jo Wiggins in my office, who many know uh, is having helped uh, uh, shape a great deal of what we did with CARES. And I'm very hopeful, again, that this plan will be one of the key factors that moves us from stable to sustainable. The mayor's budget reflects that move on its own. It should be bolstered by the American Rescue Plan. So from here, we're going to start moving to a process of deliberation with the Metro Council. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about what I've talked about here, certainly what we're posting to our website, contents of the ordinance, and so forth. I do want to be mindful that while that budget process is underway, there are going to be concurrent challenges which will touch the Metro Council and touch the public overall. The largest, in my, I'm sorry, in my view, is what I referred to at the beginning. These are our post-employment benefits, our OPEP. Most people know that is the uh, medical uh, provisions for our retirees. There's been a longstanding uh, debate uh, over this. The liabilities have grown. They now stand at more than $4 billion. I've been working with the Employee Benefits Board, uh, Shannon Hall, my counterpart at Human Resources, other board members, and a study and formulating committee. And we are looking right now at a plan that would move the retirees from the plan they are on today to a very similar plan, very few changes in the benefits, but a resulting uh, contribution to Metro's financial stability of about $1 billion in present value. That's a big number, $1 billion. That will be happening concurrently. There is a vote about this with the Employee Benefits Board next Tuesday. If that's successful, we'll move to the Metro Council, and I will be urging all involved to accept this plan, and let's make that $1 billion contribution uh, to this budget. At the same time, we're going to have needs, cash needs. I've already described for you what that could be in terms of grant funding for the ARP. 
We're also expecting over the course of the next few years that uh, the Metro Water Services, who typically has seasonal cash flow that's greater, uh, much greater in some months than their actual consumption, their ability to loan that around the Metro government and what we call our TAN system is likely to climb. The pressures of expansion will be upon them. And so the Metro government will need its own cash resources as opposed to those that it can borrow within the government to really sustain itself. And then, of course, there's the emergency response. We've called that the rainy day over the last uh, year or two. It's an important term, one used a lot of places. Nationals to the point to where it doesn't seem rain is quite befitting. We've had to become very good at emergency uh, response. So I think we'll be rebranding a bit as we think about that cash consumption. Likewise, economic development, growth of the community. The mayor's talked a great deal about the Oracle arrangement. That too will be concurrent with this process, one that I hope gains a lot of support. It is a key driver to our future. It is, uh, in my view, a flagship to our economic growth and sends the message to the world that Nashville is open for business. And while we look at that flagship at this moment, we have other things that are going to be happening as well. We're trying to develop a speedway at the fairgrounds, one subject to a lot of comment, controversy, also happening concurrently with this. We will be bringing some other things in front of the Metro Council, uh, some of which are routine, the renewal of our tax anticipation notes and some of our debt instruments, and some other things that are not routine, uh, the largest of which is that this is a good time for us to end the practice of selling our delinquent property taxes uh, to outside vendors for collection. We have a bit of excess revenue and some cash, and it's a good year for us to end that program. It's become quite costly, and I think in the eyes of many, um, not just costly from a monetary standpoint, but socially costly as well. And so we'll be bringing forward some legislation to end that program. And um, if we ever want to reinitiate it, then we'll need to come back to get uh, some other arrangement and some other permission from the Metro Council to do it. But I'm delighted that we can make that happen this year. So the budget will not be the only thing happening over the next few weeks. A lot of concurrent challenges, a lot of touch points with our Metro Council and the public. And with that, I will end my remarks and turn it over to Andrea to introduce the folks from the mayor's office. Thank you, Kevin. After hearing about the financial footing that Metro is on, it's time now to turn to two members of the Mayor's Office of Performance Management who will share some investment highlights about how the Mayor will leverage this opportunity for education, transportation, affordable housing, and of course, Nashville's neighborhoods. Please help me welcome Kristen Wilson and Diego Iguarte. Good morning. As a quick orientation, the Metropolitan Government of Nashville Davidson County's operating budget covers two significant functions. Metro Nashville Public Schools at approximately a billion in general fund operating costs, as Kevin just shared, and general government funding functions such as fire prevention, policing, our court systems, codes and property inspections, social services, parks, libraries, and transportation. These functions are approximately $1.6 billion in the proposed FY22 operating budget. Our workforce of public servants whose skills, training, and experience ensure the delivery of services, in some occasions saving lives, is fundamental to the overall success of our city by many measures and in the daily experience of residents and visitors to our city. There are approximately 9,500 authorized employee positions in the general government and another 9,000 in MMPS. Over the past 20 years, this authorized employee population has grown by about 8%. Though taken into, into account organization structure changes based on HR data, we have fewer employees in general government than we did in 2003. While at the same time, the Davidson County population we serve has grown over 23%. And of an interesting side note, our assessed property value in Davidson County has grown by 282% in that same time period. Next slide, please. The last 13 months have been like no other in Nashville's history. At each and every emergency challenge, tornado, pandemic, civil unrest, derecho, bombing, winter weather, flooding, our government has been necessary to protect life, health, safety, and the continuity of government services has been critical to our recoveries. Impacts on city operations and infrastructure are ultimately human impacts in our community. 
At the same time, since at least December 2019 and until this past March, Metro government has been under some form of spending reduction or hiring freeze due to our historically challenging financial position compounded by the uncertainties and risks presented by the global pandemic and our emergencies from natural disaster, civil unrest and the bombing. As a result, this year we have walked a very tight line to ensure we're enabling our essential employees, which have been ably serving the public throughout this pandemic with less resources and incredible challenges in front of them. We have served our fundamental life, health and safety purpose in a year that's focused us on that purpose like no other. And our first responders, police, fire, OEM, and our incredibly important Department of Emergency Communications, our 911 uh, call takers who are often uh, unseen but are incredibly valuable members of our team, along with our public health department and many other functions have performed ably to prevent and minimize loss of life and property damage. Further, we have also had increasing demand, not just on public health and first responders, but also for residential trash and recycling, increased utilization of and impact to our parks and related facilities, increased calls for mental health assistance, domestic violence assistance, and social services assistance, increased support for financial assistance, such as payment deferrals, tax relief freeze applications, and construction and development demand on codes, fire, water, sewer, and public works has not ceased. We have modified non-essential activities in our departments to support essential pandemic response, from staffing 24-7 homeless shelters, distributing masks and educating the public on public health orders, enforcing those public health orders, developing and delivering digital programming to support MMPS from the libraries and MMPS childcare from our parks. And while we had approximately a third of our employees do this work from home at its peak as an important safety, risk management, and business continuity tool, we have managed, surveyed, and monitored to ensure that that work occurred and productivity was maintained, and in many cases exceeded, due to the increasing demands we've met. All internal departments such as HR, finance, ITS have witnessed an increase in workload and have been able to maintain and in some cases improve levels of productivity. We have sustained essential services delivery against our core missions at the same time that many of those delivery models had to change to keep our residents, visitors, and employees safe. We enter FY22 with the following. We've demonstrated the commitment and dedication of our leadership and our employees to this community, and there is a morale factor that we carry forward with this. Agility and a capability for innovation and change. We've made incredible strides in technology and automation, implementing new payment capabilities, electronic filing systems, virtual inspections, and new approaches to communication and citizen experience that we will maintain and sustain. A demonstration of the strength that comes from interagency collaboration and community-based effort. All of our emergencies have required new constellations of public agencies, private entities, and individuals to respond. And these relationships have tremendous opportunity for creating greater value in the spirit of helping our community and very efficient overall operations. But in some important cases, we are now operating below minimal efficiency as we have held employees and departments spending constant, or in the case of FY21, lowered for many years in the context of growth and the demands and challenges of our recent emergencies. We now have backlogs of non-essential administration and infrastructure tasks to address. As a result, there are many important needs to consider for funding this year. Next slide, please. Last year, our mayor and Metro Council made a critically important choice to maintain the continuity of our services. And because of that, Nashville's been able to meet our repeated emergencies and challenges, and we will recover stronger and faster than we would without those services. Our challenge going into this budget are to recover internally as well as meet the expectations of a growing and recovering city. As a result, we've been very focused on delivering an investment budget directed at meeting needs and fixing problems to support and accelerate a recovery that seeks to leave no one behind. These investments are directed at education, safety and justice, transportation, neighborhoods and affordable housing in particular, as well as enabling our employees working in those fields to be as effective in service delivery as possible. We believe that investing in our work generates returns for our city, but must also be balanced by the costs of and the financial capacity for doing so. This includes understanding and considering costs of service delivered to our residents and visitors and the impact of the proposed investments. Building a budget is a significant optimization exercise, trading off needs, priorities, costs, and benefits. 
One year's resources will not ever cover all of our needs, but consistent investment in those things that matter most, and as resources arise, including being positioned for maximizing the use of federal and state funding, we will further and support a government to foster a stronger Nashville. Principles we use to guide our investment decisions included community safety and wellness, particularly for our children, most vulnerable in those communities in greatest need. I'm not sure there's a greater investment in long-term wellness than one in our school system focused on delivering better outcomes for our children. Meeting, de means of, meeting demands of a growing and recovering city while seeking opportunities to use our growth to further a city that works for everyone. At one point, we tried to account for the number of investments that were made from an equity platform in the budget and what we realized and could argue is just about every investment we've proposed has an equity component to it. Continuously improve, fix things and get better at meeting our community's needs. But let's move on to the resulting investments and what results Nashville will get for these. Please allow me to introduce Diego, our director of our Office of Performance Management to provide further details on the spending proposed in the FY22 operating budget. Next slide, please. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good morning. I will be walking us through the, uh, this budget's investment highlights for each of our priorities, starting, of course, with education. As we know, our student population is widely diverse, and that means that we have a multitude of specific needs we need to serve. With more than one-third of students being from low-income households and 17% being English language learners, we must not only prioritize education as an investment, but we also need to be intentional and strategic about where we invest. Recruiting the best talent out there to join our esteemed teachers and staff is a step that we must take to give our students the best education our school system can offer. Retaining that talent, new and experienced, is a key success component for such a significant investment to have the long-term impact that we are looking for in our community. This is not only a change in pay per se, but a change in organizational culture and it will set us in the right direction for many years to come. Social and emotional learning is a pressing need that we must also address to get back on track. With a record 81 million in funding for MNPS, over 50 million are specifically directed to have our teachers be the best paid in the state. We are also proposing over 8 million for support staff for their step and goal increases. Another 2.5 million going to social emotional learning on top of federal dollars. The state low level of investment in Nashville's higher needs drives us to commit to these uh, record level of, of investment to ensure that we are doing everything in our power to provide a better education and future for our students across the county. For us, it is very simple. Better teachers mean better schools. Better schools mean better outcomes for students. How will we know if this is successful? In addition to what MMPS already reports on, Mayor Cooper asked us to partner with our data team to put together a public dashboard with a set of indicators that will show how and where our investments in education are paying off. We are still working on specific metrics, but we will have performance indicators in areas such as academic experience measures, such as third grade students at or above grade level, percentage of students who meet ready uh, graduate, college career readiness. We also have um, metrics for teacher and staff to measure attrition, retention, effectiveness measures non-academic experience measures, such as percentage of chron uh, chronically absent students, students with satisfactory average attendance rates. These are among other potential measures that we can use to track our progress and see these outcomes materialize. Please keep an eye out for our announcements for when the, the first iteration of this effort will be up and running. We are looking forward to your feedback and we are very excited to see our students thrive as a result of these collective efforts. Next slide, please. Safety and justice. Metro population has grown nearly 2.5% over the last five years and over 10% over the last 10. Unfortunately, our staffing capabilities have not stayed on par with the accelerated growth of the city. Our staffing ratios across Metro in most areas and divisions of our safety focused departments are lower than our peer cities and or those recommended by recognized organizations in each specific field. Expanding access to safety services for every resident ensuring equitable coverage and response, and investing in community-focused strategies are the center of our proposed investment increases of almost 35 million combined for all community safety and justice departments. 
our staffing investments will help to improve and maintain response times for our emergency and first responders. It will also make an important difference in staffing to apparatus ratios. When responding to incidents, will make it safer, uh, safer not only for residents, but for responders themselves. With a promising 26% decrease in our 911 answered time year over year, averaging just six seconds, and after a record year for emergencies, we are proposing nearly half a million in additional investments to DEC and OEM respectively. These additional investments will help making our entire response process more, more effective and efficient, expanding our capacity to respond to disasters and save lives. Managing our resources to ensure equitable responses is a top priority and a clear objective of these investments, which is why we expect to see the additional over 100 field responders to be assigned equitably across the county, and in some cases, such as staffing the Southeast Precinct, to be targeted to address underserved areas and communities. Besides the eight officers funded for our uh, body worn camera program, another 1.6 million will go to the district attorney and public defender offices combined. We are committed to our objective of reducing crime rates by 5% year over year. And we also understand that during this pandemic in areas such as violent crimes and homicides, we are facing particularly challenging times. To address these and all challenges that relate to our law enforcement agencies, we are funding a group of initiatives, but we're following closely the guidelines recommended by the policy, uh, Policing Policy Commission. Other effects of the pandemic are in areas as our Metro Office of Family Safety. We saw a 29% increase in client visits over the previous year, which is why we are proposing a 1.1 million increase in their funding. We are also increasing our investments in correctional health for over 4 million and another million for the Behavioral Health Care Center at the Sheriff's Office. Metro's Bureau of Health Equity and our partnership with the Mental Health Co-op. Lastly, in partnership with departments and OMB, we are focusing specific investments to true up budget uses and addressing funding gaps that we have been dragging along for some time now. Having clear budget practices and budgetary discipline is key to successful operations and a reflection of true financial stewardship. We are looking at over 8 million of proposed, uh, proposed investments to cover for key administrative uses, such as contractual increase obligations, IT applications, paid family leave for shift work that cannot be vacant, among others. We are also allocating over 1 million for our courts, clerics, and support agencies to address multiple administrative needs as well, process and system improvements, among other needs. Uh, transportation. We have identified the need for a dedicated entity spe uh, specifically focused on transportation, an entity that can plan for and manage the appropriate levels of resources required to provide high quality services, particularly in areas that affect Nashville's residents and visitors' commutes, quality of life, mobility, and access to other services. Our needs in this area are serious, and the opportunities to stretch our dollars to achieve much needed improvements are available and within reach. We are outspokenly focused on finding and leveraging multiple sources of funding, and also to tackle first those specific areas that we know will have the, uh, the most impact in our community. Equity and community participation are central to our transportation strategies. Most of our transportation funding comes from the capital budget and federal and state grants. As part of our comprehensive transportation plan strategy, we will continue to identify and capitalize on every single opportunity to access external funding resources, which will help us maximize our return investment. That said, we are proposing important investments in this area included in our operating budget proposal. With a 3.5 million investment, we will double the staff for capital projects, bike lanes, and traffic calming by fully staffing our traffic management center. We will see significant increases in staff for right of way with 33% and for sidewalk management with 25%. All of these adds up to a total 42 new positions for the Department of Transportation. A fully staffed traffic management center will address traffic congestion via smart signals, improving performance across the county, which in combination with significant investments in MTA will resort in a more efficient and frequent bus service. This investment of over 25 million for MTA 
to restore funding previously fulfilled by Federal CARES Act, and a better working system overall will attract new users, will raise our ridership levels, and therefore reduce our cost per rider. This will make uh, this a much more effective and efficient investment. Mayor Cooper has requested to improve sidewalk construction times by 50% and reduce cost by 20% within 12 months. Our sidewalk, paving, and traffic management enhancements will result in life-saving improvements for uh, motorists and pedestrians. And they will also result in notable spending efficiencies as well as a much better resident and user experience. Just like everything else with our transportation plan, we are focused on delivering equitable, distributed, and community-centric solutions. Our neighborhoods. In addition to education, community safety, and transportation, we must provide appropriate services for Nashville's residents and neighborhoods. Just as we are investing in quality transportation infrastructure, optimal neighborhood infrastructure is essential for Nashvilleans' quality of life and to make our neighborhoods more livable and sustainable. We will also have to properly staff the agencies that service our neighborhoods at appropriate levels based on demand increases and our strategic objectives. Just via Hub Nashville, we have experienced more than a doubling of community requests in the last two years, with over 260,000 requests just this fiscal year to date. On average, Metro Water has received nearly 13,000 more calls every month on this fiscal year compared to the previous one. Our neighborhood's livability highly depends on Metro providing access to our park systems and library. While during the pandemic, they saw a decrease in their traditional service delivery models, they are expecting a full recovery and we are looking to increase utilization of these public spaces. This is why we're investing an additional 2.9 million in parks department, which includes parks police and specialty staffing for key facilities, and one million increase for public libraries, which will include bringing uh, NASA employees in-house. To improve our residential customer experience, we are investing an additional 1.1 million in the codes department and another 1.1 million in the planning department. Both departments will see important staffing increases focused on areas that will result in faster and quality reviews for safety and zoning. Metro's goal to reduce our carbon emissions, our commitment to renewable sourcing of energy, and our goal to divert waste from landfills will see a 1.5 million increase as part of this proposed budget. This includes increasing our recycling cadence to every other week. In fiscal year 20 alone, Metro processed over 58,000 tons of recycled materials and 164,000 tons of solid waste. We expect that with these investments, see a significant shift in the recycling tonnage by offering this change. This is the first step we're taking to follow the recommendations from the Sustainability Advisory Committee. To support Nashville's most vulnerable, we are proposing an increase in six, uh, of 6.4 million of, uh, for Nashville General Hospital and over 2 million that will go to social services, highly focused on homelessness initiatives and for the arts, uh, the arts commissions combined. Recognizing the importance of the arts commission's role as part of our neighborhood's rebound we are proposing a 13% increase for their budget, which includes racial equity and restorative arts programs. Affordable housing. This administration is well aware and actively concerned about the shortage of affordable housing units in Nashville. And we are focused on expanding their availability. It is not only important to grow the total available units, but to also ensure that the existing inventory is maintained in appropriate conditions. It is true that today, for many living in Nashville is not an option they can afford. To address the inventory issue and the conditions of it, we are proposing to significantly invest in this area. We are immediately making progress on five of the Affordable Housing Task Force recommendations. And to successfully implement and execute our affordable housing efforts, we are expanding our operating management and planning capabilities, making affordable housing central to everything that we do when planning for and rezoning our neighborhoods. Therefore, we are doubling the current staff focused on affordable housing with two additional positions in our planning department specifically devoted to this priority. To continue to grow our inventory, we are expanding Metro's funding going to the Barnes Fund by 25% for a total of 12.5 million. We will also be implementing multiple tools additional to the Barnes Fund as recommended by the task force. Outside of the efforts funded 
as part of this operating budget proposal. We will also leverage other tools such as payment in lieu of taxes, participation agreements, an additional 10 million for the Barnes Fund, and another 10 million for Catalyst Housing, which will allow for a quick action to preserve affordable units. Using a similar strategy than in our transportation efforts, we are looking to capitalize in all opportunities available to leverage non-metro resources, looking to enhance the impact of every dollar we invest in this priority. Combined with designated ARP funds, we will triple the investment in affordable housing this year. The combination of specialized staffing, strategic investments, community participation, and the expansion of our toolkit, we are confident that our funding, that our funding proposal for affordable housing will deliver the results that Nashville needs. Our investment highlights for uh, affected government. The need for transparency, visibility, and accountability are clear to this administration. We understand that our resources are limited and that we must maximize value through smart investments. We also understand that the value of said investments must be clearly communicated and understood by everyone. Just as we have asked for community input in many areas, we want to ensure to keep the public informed, not only with our plans and policy initiatives, but with our results and operations. The same data that we gather and analyze to make informed operating decisions. It's the data that we now share with Nashville's residents. Having access to operating and performance data has allowed us to execute proficiently as an organization. And it has also allowed, us, uh, allowed this administration to clearly understand the needs and stories behind each department's operations. This data also provides useful insight not only to manage our day-to-day -day operations, but to make decisions regarding Metro's future operating needs. Having this data concentrated in just one place has proven to be of great help for decision making and for communicating internally. We have seen our organizational culture embrace and quickly adopt data driven strategies and prioritizing effectivity and efficiency for service delivery across the board. All this granted by the visibility and accountability that these efforts bring to the table. We have demonstrated our appetite to invest significantly and aggressively when and where it makes sense. We believe in evidence-based investing, and we take our responsibility to efficiently spend Metro's limited resources very, very seriously. We will continue to partner with departments across Metro to find opportunities to improve and modernize processes and systems with a pivotal focus on improving customer experience and deliver excellent quality services. Finally, we want to offer our residents accessible and usable information to hold us accountable and to be able to see the effects of their taxes on Metro's performance and outcomes. We welcome you to follow our performance improvement journey by visiting our website and check our five live dashboards. This is still work in progress. We will continue to add content and you can expect changes and improvements on the portal itself. We are currently adding thousands of data points every month. We understand that you will be interested in many uh, additional details regarding our budget and our performance data. Uh, for the budget, please refer to the budget ordinance. Uh, for performance data, please refer to Hub Nashville. Uh, you can uh, ask about anything there. If we can go to the next slide, uh, how to access our website it, within nashville.gov and the mayor's office page. You can find uh, in the menu on the left, you will find performance management. And there you can access all five uh, dashboards, as you can see on the right, uh, the right side of this slide. Um, I believe that it's uh, it for me. Thank you for your time and attention. And um, uh, Kristen, uh, welcome back. Appreciate it. Thank you, Diego. In terms of next steps, the mayor's, oh, you can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, the mayor's proposed budget ordinance has been filed with the Metro clerk, and we will now move into Metro Council deliberations. In discussions with our Metro Council budget chair, Councilmember Toombs, we'll be looking forward to working sessions in Q&A in the coming weeks. On behalf of Mayor John Cooper, we'd like to thank the finance team, particularly Tom Edelman, who leads the Office of Budget and Management. To our department heads and elected officials, whose leadership during this challenging year is perhaps only overshadowed by the demonstrated commitment of Metro's and MMPS's frontline employees, thank you as well. Our work this year has been among the finest examples of true public service. 
To Council, we look forward to continuing our service together to make this budget and our government the best it can be for our residents and visitors of Nashville. Thank you. Kristen, Diego, Kevin, thank you. And thank you, Nashville, for joining us this morning. From here, Mayor Cooper's proposed budget, of course, is before Metro Council for consideration and approval. Stay in touch with us along the way. Visit us at Nashville.gov. And of course, please follow Mayor John Cooper on social media. We are headed toward 50 by five full immunization and the lifting of public health restrictions coming soon. So it's our pleasure and privilege to broadcast to you today from the Metro Courthouse. We hope to reconnect with you soon in person. Until then, thank you for your time. Take care, stay safe. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.